B, we can, we can start. Uh, so welcome to 130B, uh, quantum mechanics. So today uh, we will continue discussion, uh, second quantization, and uh, we, I will also talk about uh, quantum statistics. So let's, uh, let me first recap. Uh, uh, so in the past few lectures, we introduced uh, the second quantization. It's an algebraic system which uh, describes quantum many-body states with identical particles. And last time, we also talked about how to uh, define operators which add uh, or remove particles in such systems. So our goal was to define uh, quantum many-body systems where the system is made of identical particles. And previously, we learned that in that situation, we'd better use the occupation number to label the independent states. And then for these states, there are two possibilities. Either these are made of bosons or made of fermions. And for bosons, this occupation number goes all the way to infinity. For fermions, it can only be 0 or 1. And then there is a very useful uh, fact, is that there is a connection between this uh, particle number occupation basis, which is the Fock state. Uh, you can always rewrite a Fock state in terms of the first quantized language, in terms of uh, putting the pr tensor product, uh, each, the state of each individual particles together, and either symmetrize to make a bosonic uh, state, or anti-symmetrize to make a fermionic state. So that is the foundation, that is the basis to describe uh, the Fock states. And built on these states, uh, last time we talked about how to add or remove particle into the system. And the key idea is that because these bosonic or fermionic states is made in such a way that they need to either symmetrize or anti-symmetrize. So if you try to add one more particle which carries its own state, basically you need to tensor product another single particle state into this already very long tensor product, you need to make sure that this tensor product, when you tensor product new state into the system, it, it doesn't spoil this uh, symmetrization or anti-symmetrization structure. So we must be very careful when we add a new particle or remove an remove a particle, we need to add in a recursive manner such that every time we add a new particle, that means we tensor product a new state, we need to be, be sure to tensor product, in, it, tensor product this new state in every possible uh, places, and then uh, followed by the same symmetrization and anti or anti-symmetrization rules. Only in such a way, when we create a new particle in the system or remove the particle, the remaining or the resulting state is still uh, sy symmetrized or, or anti-symmetrized, depending on whether you are talking about bosonic or fermionic systems. So these recursive relations uh, is basically unique. If you require this uh, symmetrization property to preserve, for example, then if you start from a symmetrized state, and this is the only way that you can keep the symmetrization, and that's the, also the only way that you can keep anti-symmetrization if you start from anti-symmetrized state. All, the, all this depends on whether you take a plus sign here or minus sign here. Symmetrized state, you take a plus sign, and anti-symmetrized state, you take, take this minus sign. So just follow this very um, st strict algebraic requirement that we can develop a system uh, which describes both on creation and, and, and annihilation, which basically uh, the creation and annihilation operator corresponding to adding the state into the many-body system or adding this particle to many-body system and, uh, and, and following this uh, normalization factor. And that's the formula. And by defining the creation and annihilation operator, we can actually show that how they actually act on this particle number occupation basis, and then which is the Fock state. And then we conclude that there are these uh, formulas which tells you how the bosonic creation and annihilation operator uh, acts. And this operator, uh, and it is uh, worth noting that there is a square root uh, prefactor in front of the state. And this square root is necessary in order to ensure that uh, these, all these uh, number basis states are orthogonal, uh, uh, sorry, are normalized. Uh, otherwise, if you don't have this factor, then the resulting state will not be norm one. Uh, that can be seen by going through the first quantized language and then try to check that. 
But anyway, given these results, uh, we can see another intuition to see that this is necessary is that if you start from a vacuum state where there's already no particle to be annihilated, but if you still want, wish to apply the annihilation operator on the vacuum state, the system should be such that it should have a safeguard. It should prevent you from doing illegal things, like pre prevents you from reaching the minus one <laughs> particle number state, and the system is doing that by actually putting a factor in the front. This factor, when n alpha is zero, will automatically become zero that quenches whatever illegal state that is going to follow behind. So uh, this is a safe uh, safety mechanism to ensure that if you apply annihilation operator on a vacuum state, and that is zero. And actually, given that there is this square root m factor in the annihilation operator, it is almost, there's no choice that the creation operator must have this n square, uh, square root n plus one, because either, otherwise this is not a Hermitian conjugate of the, uh, the creation will not be the Hermitian conjugate of annihilation operator. So uh, the, uh, if you don't want to go through the, the detail of deriving this, this is some uh, idea that you can use to memorize these formulas. So this prefactor in the front actually has to do with the number of ways that you can insert the particle or delete the particle. If you already have n particle, then and there are n plus one different places that you can insert a new particle, and there's n different places where you can remove a particle. So that's why there's this factor in the front. Okay, so given those uh, rules, one can pretty easily show that if you apply B dagger B to the n particle uh, state, uh, basically it shows that this state is an eigenstate of this operator with the eigenvalue, which exactly equal to the number of particles. So from that, we conclude that B dagger B actually counts the particle number. So that is actually a magic because it's like you are removing a particle and then putting a particle into the system uh, or Originally, you think it doesn't do anything, but actually it counts the number of particles in the system, which is an uh, interesting property of this bosonic operator. And then you can see that uh, there, this, this factor is sometimes also called the boson enhancement factor. This is because if you, uh, if you start from a, uh, a zero particle state and apply a creation operator, you get a one particle state with a norm one. But if you start from a 100 particle state and create one more particle, yes, you get a 101. You have 101 particle state, but there is a, there is a much larger prefactor in front of that state. That means the boson system tends to to add more particle on the state which is already which already occupied by a lot of bosons. For example, you have an alpha state and a beta state. Alpha state is already occupied by 100 bosons. Beta state currently occupied by zero boson. Adding a one boson into the alpha state, the, the, the overall weight of the state will increase by a, by a factor which is of the order square root of 100, right? It's like 10 times. You will basically boost this vector 10 times by adding one more particle to this uh, alpha state, but if you add one, one more particle to the beta state, it doesn't have that effect. So this is called the boson enhancement effect. And this effect basically describes the tendency that in a bosonic system, bosons are like, uh, uh, like people in a society which try to follow other people's behavior. So if there's already 100 people investing open AI, then uh, you also want to invest that, right? So, so something like that. People has this tendency to follow uh, others, and uh, that's the behaviors of bosons. But then we go to the fermionic system. Uh, so, okay, let me briefly mention that all the discussion above can be generalized to multi-mode system, and for multi-mode system, eventually we can end up, with, uh, we can obtain the algebraic relation uh, among these uh, boson creation and annihilation operators. So now let's go to fermion. Fermion has a very different uh, property because its first quantized wave function is anti-symmetric. And the way we define annihilation and creation operator, it still looks uh, pretty much similar. The only difference is actually to take care of this anti-symmetrization by using the other version of insertion and deletion operator with this minus sign, which uh, denotes that when you do this uh, operation, you need to 
always put the minus sign every time you exchange one particle to uh, with the another particle. Okay, so from f based on that rule, uh, one can show that, for example, it is impossible to add two mo two particles, two fermions on the single state, because if you already have one fermion. For example, this n alpha is already one. Then, if you try to create another fermion on this uh, one particle occupied state, uh, then uh, it is in impossible because one minus one will be zero. So this prefactor precisely suppress the addition of addition, uh, more fermion to the system. And then, uh, but if this is n alpha is zero, which means you start from the vacuum state, then you are allowed to add one more fermion. And the, uh, and the effect of applying this operator simply takes the uh, zero uh, state, which is the vacuum state, to a, a one alpha state, which means one particle occupying uh, alpha. Okay, and then. And then for annihilation operator, it's also similar. If you start from the vacuum state, and this prefactor basically has a safeguard effect that prevents you from reaching the negative particle number state. But if you uh, start from a one particle state, then this prefactor simply becomes one. And then that means you start from a one particle state, annihilation will give you the zero particle state. So for fermion, it's very simple because its particle number can only take zero or one. It's like a switch, right? Either open or close, or either <laughs> turn on or turn off, right? So occupy or empty, there's only two choice. And then the creation annihilation operator in this scenario is very simple. It is just switch on or switch off. It's just like that, it's switching between these two uh, uh, possibilities. And then uh, with these rules, you can further show that in this case, although the prefactor doesn't look like the prefactors uh, of bosons, but uh, the rules are a little bit different. But, uh, but, uh, but the fact that the C dagger C also counts the fermion particle number, it remains uh, the same uh, ideas. Okay? So, uh, so the idea is like, because there are only two different cases, we can basically enumerate them, right? Because if uh, n alpha is zero, then uh, you start from the zero state, try to apply C dagger C. You first apply C, which is try to annihilate the state. But by doing that, you already quench the state. The state becomes zero. <laughs> it becomes a zero vector instead of the zero state. So, so we need to distinguish the zero state, which is still a, a, a legitimate normalized quantum state. And then this is zero vector, which is really a mathematical zero, meaning that this vector length is zero. This vector is a vector which has length one, which has norm one. It is just labeled by zero particle number. It corresponds to the vacuum state. For example, in harmonic oscillator, it corresponds to the ground state. In this fermionic system, of course, we can't talk about ground state of something, but it's actually a still a legitimate uh, norm one quantum mechanical state but unlike this zero vector. So what I'm talking about is that if you apply C dagger C to this state, you basically get a zero vector. So that it's indeed, you get the particle number multiplying the state. So it, is, um, it satisfies that, right? Although we don't know what state is there, but uh, it satisfies this eigen equation. Uh, and the, and the non-trivial thing is that if you start from this one, and then uh, applying the annihilation operator will annihilate it to zero, I mean, this zero state, and then the creation operator will take you back. So uh, you can see there's an invisible factor in front of this state, which is one. So applying C dagger C on uh, one particle occupied state for the fermionic system actually also counts the particle number and then multiply the state. So in this case, we basically, because it's only, only two cases, we can enumerate. So we can simply by enumeration and show that uh, applying this C dagger C operator indeed correspond to a number operator, and all these particle number eigenstates are re indeed eigenstates of these number operators. And uh, uh, similar to boson systems, we can also create, uh, use creation operator acting on the vacuum state to create all possible uh, fermion occupation uh, states. But this, uh, this is, uh, this, uh, but this reflects a very different characteristics of a fermion compared to bosons. Fermions are like those individuals which uh, pursues uh, like uh, freedoms or, <laughs> or individualism. <laughs> it's like they, they are those people, they don't want to be the same with others. If they already see that certain position or certain state has been occupied by one particle, they don't want to occupy that position again. They don't want to be in the same state as the other particles. So they always seek to find new possibilities, to find new states to occupy. So that's the idea. 
And this actually has, uh, it's very interesting because in our universe, all the mat matters are built by fermions and all the fo force medi mediators are built by bosons. For example, photon mediate the electromagnetic interaction. This is because for bosons, due to this characteristic, that bosons always want to do the same thing. So they can actually have this collective behavior. So it's like a collectionism. <laughs> it's like those people which, um, which try to join their force together and do something big. So for the force mediator, that's the characteristic we require because this force media mediate mediate needs to propagate for a long distance. For example, they need to come from the photon, need to come all the way from the sun, reaching the Earth. And then you need to have many photons coherently doing those things. So that's the uh, characteristics of bosons. And you can have many bosons occupying the same frequency of the mode, for example, and then uh, such that we can have a visible uh, intensity of light. Otherwise, if the light always want to occupy different states, then we can't really see a uh, a single color light, for example, because there can't, can't be lasers, there can't be photons occupying the same frequency if it, it, if, if it were fermions. But for matter particles, for example, for like electrons, and then for electrons, because we need to use this electron to build our body. So we need matters to repel each other. So for example, we have two atoms. We don't want them to collapse into each other. So the reason that the atoms don't collapse into each other, because every atom on its outside is covered by electron cloud. And then these electrons are fermions, so they don't want to be in the same places. So if you put two atoms that is too close to each other, the electron clouds start to overlap which means there becomes a larger, there's a larger probability for you to find two electrons separate, separately coming from two different atoms, which actually sits on the same places, which they are not happy with that. So because of this Pauli exclusion principle that prevents all these fermions to overlap with each other, and that is one reason that uh, these atoms are uh, uh, basically eventually under pressure, you can still uh, re retain the stability of these matters. So that's why, for example, our Earth doesn't immediately collapse under the action of gravitation. Because under gravity, all the matters want to go into the same point. But the Earth doesn't do that. So th this is because uh, underlying uh, the Earth, we are made of uh, electrons and quarks. And all those are fermions. Fermions always want to occupy the different states. So they have uh, eventually developed an uh, interesting world, which has a finite volume, which has so many different diversity and variations. So these very different characteristics between fermions and bosons leads to a very uh, different uh, physics uh, in these many body systems in our quantum world. And then uh, we actually derive all these, all starting from the basic principles that we have some quantum mechanics principle at a very fundamental level. And then we require that it is describing a many body system which is made of particles which are identical. And just by this assumption that particles are identical, we are able to uh, basically uh, derive that there are two different classes, bosons and fermions. And we further derive that there are very different algebraic relations between these operators. I, I want to say one more <laughs> about this line, which is about the fermions. You can also generalize uh, this uh, fermion creation and annihilation operator to multi-modes. And then the idea is very simple. Uh, it's very similar, I mean. Uh, but there's only one difference. Maybe you notice that there, instead of this, uh, apart from the square root factor, there's another plus or minus sign. When I put a minus sign with, with, uh, to the power of something, I really mean that it is a minus sign. But whether it's a minus sign or a plus sign depends on the parity of this number on the exponent. And what is this number? This number is to summing over all the particles number, uh, all the fermion number uh, on the mode beta, where beta is preceding alpha. Meaning that suppose you start from a state which is described by the, uh, for, for example, there's n particle, n beta particle occupying the beta state, n alpha particle occupying alpha state. Of course, all these n can only be 0 or 1 in a fermion system. But nevertheless, they are <laughs> integers, right? So if you, want, if you try to add one more fermion to this n alpha state, what you have to do in first quantization is you take this fermion all the way through all the other already existing fermions 
fermions. For example, this n beta is one, meaning that there's already one fermion occupying the beta state where beta states stands in front of alpha states. So in order to take the creation operator all the way through the fermions that already occupy all these previous modes, and then let this creation operator hit the alpha mode in order to increase this n alpha by one, uh, uh, actually, if n alpha start from zero, you increase by one. If n alpha start from one, then you basically decrease by one. And basically, it's a switching effect. But uh, in order for that effect to take place, you first need to permute or switch or exchange this operator <laughs> with all the existing fermions. So by doing that, you will accumulate a lot of signs every time. Previously, we say if you exchange the two fermion states, you will accumulate minus sign. But if you exchange the fermion creation operator with an existing fermion, that will also create a minus sign. Because you can always think that this uh, existing fermion is actually created by a fermion creation operator. So the fact of exchanging the creation operator with a fermion is actually exchanging the creation operator with the creation operator that were, were originally creating that fermion, right? But for this creation operator, they have, a, they have an algebraic property, which maybe I didn't mention previously, but, um, uh, but yeah, <laughs> maybe I should mention here that they actually satisfy the so-called anti-commutation relations, uh, which means that, uh, that exchanging the creation operator of two fermions actually is also, uh, also accumulates a minus sign, which means uh, for example, uh, C alpha dag, uh, C beta dagger for alpha not equal to beta actually is minus C beta dagger, C alpha dagger. That's, that's what, I, what I mean by the anti-commute. Exchanging them leads to a minus sign. So if you take this e equation and then, uh, and then rewrite it, uh, you can rewrite it into this formula, right? And this formula on the left-hand side, that is what people denoted as C alpha dagger, C beta and then with a, with a curry bracket. This curry bracket, instead of the square bracket, we know the square bracket uh, correspond to the commutator, which means the square bracket of AB is AB minus BA. But this curry bracket of AB actually corresponds to AB plus BA. So the top one is called commutator, which we learned previously. The bottom one, the next line, the next line is called anti-commutation or anti-commutator. Okay, so th this is the this is the commutator. This is the anti-commutator. That's the definition. Uh, a, B, and B, A. Whether it's a minus sign or it's a plus sign. And the, for the fermion, sorry, for the fermion, this commute, uh, this anti-commutator actually equal to zero if they are both creation operator. And then if they are uh, both annihilation operator, that's the same idea. But, but this uh, ab rather abstract mathematical expression basically means that. And that expression basically means if you exchange the fermion creation operator, you will have to get a minus sign. And the fact that this has to be a minus sign is consistent with the fact that if you exchange two fermions, that has to be a minus sign. Because that two fermions can be viewed as starting from the vacuum state and use the creation operator to create them, right? So, so if you, cre you first create beta and then create alpha, or first create alpha and then create beta, these two different actions because uh, the two different actions will differ <laughs> by a fermion exchange. So, uh, so that's why the creation operator necessary have these, uh, uh, these uh, algebraic uh, relations that if you exchange the uh, places of, uh, exchange the order of acting creation operator, you also get a minus sign because of the fermion exchange sign. And then uh, for the creation and annihilation operator, their anti-commutator actually uh, goes like uh, Almost everywhere is still uh, zero, meaning that they're also anti-commute, but uh, but only uh, but only in the cases that C alpha equal alpha equals beta, uh, this uh, anti-commutator actually gives you one, and these can be checked by uh, going through the by by, by using this exp explicit expression. 
uh, of how the C alpha and C alpha dagger acting on the state, and one can check that uh, uh, their, their anti-commutator actually follow these rules. And to follow these rules in many body systems, uh, the, these, these are the factors that you need because these are the factors uh, that, 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 uh, that counts how many fermions that are already existing in the states that is preceding alpha uh, before you apply this alpha creation or annihilation operator to the state. state okay? So these are the technical details of how uh, these uh, Fox states <laughs> are acted by the fermion operators, which is a bit uh, more in involved. Uh, but uh, don't be panic if you don't <laughs> quite understand. These are the <laughs> results. But uh, the take-home message is basically bosons and fermions are very different uh, characteristics. Uh, one tends to, uh, uh, bosons tends to get together and all do the same thing, and fermions tends to uh, be independent from each other and always try new things. So uh, that's, uh, that this very different characteristic leads to very different statistical behavior when we have many bosons or many fermions. So OK, that's what I want to talk about about the second quantization. It's an algebraic system which tells us how to write down uh, many body basis states, like Fox states, for bosons and fermions, and how to define particle creation and annihilation operator for them, and how to define the uh, particle number counting operators. But I want to make one additional comment on the name, which is called the second quantization. Have you ever wondered why it is called second? So what is first quantization? So what is quantization? Uh, so why do people give such a very uh, uh, so uh, such, such a weird name to this uh, uh, so complicated algebraic system? So this comes from the idea that quantization is actually a process that you promote physical observables to operators. In first quantization, which we start from classical mechanics and goes to quantum mechanics, what really happens is we are promoting, for example, position, momentum, and energy operator in I mean, position, momentum, and energy, these quantities, which are physical quantity previously, classical mechanics, they're numbers. Now we are pre promoting them to operators. We, we are talking about position operator, momentum operator, energies like Hermitian, uh, sorry, Hamiltonian operator, right? We basically use operator to replace every physical quantity, which previously is a number. And then we assume that there is no physical observables that is uh, deterministic. So we cannot uh, talk about what is the position now. Tell me a number. No, there's no number. There's only a probability distribution of positions, probability distribution of momentums. Whenever you do observation in quantum system, it's always like that. So this is the idea of quantization. That is to remove the certainty in your physical system and replace by uncertainty. Remove, uh, replace uh, physical observables, which are the de deterministic number, by uh, quantum operators. But there is a loophole in the whole system, which is the wave function itself. Because when you look at the Schrodinger equation, you will see that the wave function is still a deterministic thing, right? Wave function is still a set of numbers which evolve in time in a deterministic way. So some of the physicists think that this, uh, this revolution is not complete, has not complete. So this is a first quantization revolution, basically uh, remove all the uh, all these uh, physical observable into operators, but it hasn't uh, take, uh, for example, wave function itself into an operator. Wave function still remains a function, still remains like a potential function. It's like a function, right? So uh, that's why uh, people th think about it a little bit more and think that, okay, maybe we should talk about how to quantize the wave function itself. But wave function basically is a probability amplitude, meaning that wave function, if you take norm square, uh, meaning psi dagger psi or psi star psi, that is the probability, right? So that's why the second quantization's idea is to use creation and annihilation operator to replace wave function. For example, if I want to talk about a wave function of a boson or a fermion, actually these wave functions are, in some sense, eigenvalues of the corresponding annihilation operators. So annihilation operator, basically, either for boson or for fermion, at this level, the discussion is the same. Because you can see, for boson and fermion, no matter which one you talk about, the number operator is always C dagger C. 
What is the number operator? The number operator is the operator that is repl in replacement of probability, right? Because what the probability is doing is counting the number. The, well, the number is higher, uh, that means there's more p particles, right? There's a higher probability to see the particle. So the number operator basically uh, describes the probability to see the particle on that state. And then the probability is no longer a single quantity, but it becomes a number operator as an operator. And then this operator is indeed written in the form as uh, either C dagger C or B dagger B. It looks pretty much like a wave function. <laughs> the relation between the wave function and probability distribution, that the probability to see a particle at position x is psi of x and psi of x, well, this as a star. So the number operator of, uh, uh, in this alpha state is B alpha dagger B alpha or C alpha dagger C alpha for fermions. So you can see that the B operator or C operator, uh, the annihilation operator, uh, is actually an operator <laughs> quantization uh, of this uh, wave function. So in this way, we basically promote uh, also the wave function the only remaining deterministic quantity in first quantized quantum mechanics into an uh, operator now. But if you talk about these uh, operators, we know that operator always need to act in a Hilbert space. And the Hilbert space always is a linear space that hosts quantum state. So when we talk about this bosonic and fermionic operator, they still act on states, right? This still acts on the state, like n alpha. This becomes more obvious when we talk about bosonic operators because we have already learned that all these bosonic operators, you can think of it as operators acting on harmonic oscillators wave function. So there's actually another emergent wave function, although you try to quantize the wave function of a system into an operator, but this operator still need to act on some state. And that state, again, has a wave function. And that wave function is called the super wave function or <laughs> functional, wave functional, basically. So that is the wave function of the many body system. And that wave function still remains a deterministic quantity. So even for second quantization, it is not complete. So there is a third quantization to further quantize the wave function <laughs> on which this operator acts. And once you quantize those wave function into operator, those super operator will act on even higher level, more abstract wave function. So there's infinite orders of quantization on and on. So uh, the, the, the quantum mechanics we, only, uh, we have only learned is only the tip of iceberg of all the possible levels of quantization behind. So that's why uh, I, I hope using this example to, show, to tell you that there's still a, a lot of unknown and then a, a lot of uh, uh, deeper formulations there. And you may think, oh, this is just mathematicians like a fantasy and then it's just uh, games. Actually, that's not because uh, second quantization is already the foundation of uh, many signs like condensed matter physics uh, uh, or high energy physics. Whenever you need to talk about many body systems, you, you cannot avoid using this language. But if you further go to uh, uh, other new areas like non-equilibrium quantum dynamics, that's where the third quantization will be useful because you're further away from equilibrium. And then uh, all these higher orders of quantization uh, has less and less, uh, has weaker and weaker connection to our maybe reality or real world. Maybe we don't see them very often, uh, but actually they are there and those formulations are there. So there's, a, a, there's a indefinite uh, levels of quantization that we can perform to the quantum system. And that is why uh, the current formulation is called the second quantization because it's the second time that you're trying to quantize uh, uh, physical observables, which is wave function in the system. And this, uh, this exercise can be continued on and on. So that's what I want to talk about <laughs> second quantization. And in the remaining time of today's lecture, I want to start a new discussion of quantum statistical physics. Uh, statistical physics is a subject that talk about many body systems. In classical uh, mechanics, we have statistical physics. For example, we have ideal gas, which is made of atoms which are independent, almost, almost independent from each other. So if you have a lot of atoms flying uh, in freely in the space, uh, basically that forms a phase of matter, which is called gas. 
And then uh, for gas, uh, uh, people know that there are many physical rules. For example, you have PV equals nRT, right? These ideal gas rules. And then for a long time, people have been wondering <laughs> where those rules come from. Where does thermodynamics come from? <laughs> what is the origin of that? What's the foundation of that? And then that's where statistical mechanics becomes uh, important. Because uh, uh, in the early days, people think that uh, suppose you know Newtonian dynamics, you know how what is the dynamical detail of each atom, maybe you can just take, uh, keep track of the time evolution of every atom, and then try to keep track of the velocity and position of every air molecule in the system, and then you can know the physical property of this, uh, uh, the, 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 the whole uh, air in this room, for example. And then that is actually not practical, because the number of air molecule in this uh, any macroscopic environment is huge, and there's no computational power to keep track of them. So the idea eventually becomes statistical. That means instead of trying to keep track of the precise uh, trajectory or this position of momentum of every air molecule, we actually keep track of their distribution in the phase space. We don't talk about <laughs> what is the uh, momentum or position of every, every molecule. We talk about what is the probability to find a molecule of such position or momentum uh, in, in this room, for example. That is the idea of statistical physics. And in deriving this probability distribution, we didn't actually make use of any equation of motion or the, uh, or the microscopic dynamics of the system. Uh, the, for example, we basically assume that the position is uniformly distributed. In this room, for example, the air molecule <laughs> has their position uniformly distributed. Why is that a reasonable assumption? Because because that's actually the maximum entropy assumption. You can, of course, assume that all the air molecules in this room distributed on this half, right? But if you assume that, that is not natural. This is because that is not the maximal entropy uh, kind of uh, assumption. That means if, if, if this uh, assumption of probability is not maximal entropy, meaning that you have to inject, prob inject information into this system, you need to make a prior assumptions. You need to assume that there is actually a difference between the left half of the room and the right half of the room. It is because of that difference that all the air molecule tends to occupy the left half. If you want to make that conclusion, you need to provide new, more information. Without that information, without that evidence, the only safety and unbiased uh, assumption <laughs> is that air molecule is uniformly distributed in the system. So this idea of maximum entropy estimation is the foundational principle of statistical mechanics. Statistical mechanics, although it has a word mechanics in it, it doesn't actually take care about the dynamics of this air molecule. It never care about what is the detailed dynamics of air molecule. It's just based on the maximum as, uh, entropy assumption to provide the probability distribution, estimation of probability distribution in order to, to describe many body systems. And if that is the idea in classical physics, the same idea can be applied to quantum physics. In quantum physics, we no longer talk about position and momentum of particles, but we talk about on which quantum state the particle occupy, or how many particles occupying certain states. And that is the language that we are using here. And in quantum me mechanics, so the microscope, at the microscopic level, the physical system is described by quantum mechanics, which means that there's a Hamiltonian operator. And the Hamiltonian operator tells you what are the energy eigenstates and what are the corresponding energies. And where this K labels uh, a different energy eigenstates. That's, uh, that's assumed, that's the setup. There's a quantum system described by this Hamiltonian. And then, uh, given that energy eigenstate and eigenenergies, we can try to compute uh, the macroscopic, uh, uh, for example, we can try to estimate what is the expectation value of any physical observable. In quantum mechanics, we learn that every physical observable corresponds to a Hermitian operator, and in this case, we denote it as O. And then we want to, uh, the most important question we care about is what is the expectation value of O? Of course, then we have to know how many particles are there occupying each energy eigenstate, right? What is, uh, uh, what is the probability for the system to be in that energy eigenstate, for example? 
uh, if you consider the system as a whole. <laughs> what is the probability to be in that energy eigenstate? Suppose that probability to be in the case energy eigenstate is P of K, and then once you, uh, once you make sure that the system is in that state, you can evaluate what is the expectation value of the observable of interest in that state. So the observable, uh, which is given by this operator, you can take this uh, sc scalar product by sandwiching the operator between the bra and cat state of this energy eigenstate, the K state. Because the K state has probability, it has this probability that you will sample that, uh, basically this probability like sampling, right? You are keep sampling the system from an ensemble. And the probability to see that the system in this state is P of K. But once the system is in this state, the expectation value goes like that. But then the total expectation value is like this expectation value of this particular scenario multiplied with or weighted by the probability distribution, the probability to see this scenario, right? And then summing over all the, prob all, all the possible scenarios. So this is the formula to compute the expectation value. So we can see, in order to make any prediction of macroscopic property of a many-body system, we only need to know what is the uh, first of all, what are the eigenstates, right? And, uh, but the more, more in importantly, what is this probability distribution? So this probability distribution, the physical meaning is the, dis uh, the, is the probability for the system to be in the case eigenstate. And then we are basically considering the ensemble of a, of a many-body system. And then I have a few comments here, which means that this ensemble is a classical probability mixture of the quantum pure state. So by that, I mean, uh, uh, for example, previously in quantum mechanics, we have learned that for a single qubit, you have zero state and one state. You can superposition them in linearly and form a superposition state. In the superposition state, there's also probability to see zero and one. And that superposition is called a pure state superposition. It's very different from this mixed state superposition. And this mixed state basically is there's no coherent, there's no quantum coherent between different energy levels. I'm not taking all this energy eigenstate and add them together. I'm just assuming that I'm trying to sample the system in an ensemble. And then every time I open my eye and look at the system, the system behaves as if it is in a pure state. <laughs> but uh, but that, uh, that comes with a, with a probabilistic nature that uh, every other time I open my eyes, it may be in the, the other state. And then uh, the probability for the system to be in this state uh, is given by this probability distribution. So this is also called the mixed state ensemble. And they, then this mixed state ensemble can be specified by a pure state basis together with the probability distribution that tells you what are the probability to see the system in such a set of bases instead of trying to linearly combine these bases together. That's the basic difference. OK, so therefore, the central goal in statistical physics is to infer or to establish a mixed state distribution P of K in an unbiased manner. So our goal boils down to actually compute or estimate P of K. Actually, there's no way to compute P of K, just as what I said. There's no way to com you, through computation and derive that the air molecule will distribute uniformly in the system. There's no foundation for that. The only argument for that is, maximal, is the principle of maximum entropy. This is because given our current knowledge level, if there's no reason to believe that there's a difference between the left-hand side and the right-hand side of this room, then there should not be a, there should not be a reason to believe believe that the probability for the air molecule to appear here and there are different. So that is the principle of maximum entropy. It is, uh, the idea is that you always need to assign the probability distribution. Probability distribution, instead of being derived, it is actually being assigned, not derived. It can actually be assigned arbitrarily. But the only unbiased way to assign the probability distribution is, in, is, is such that it maximizes the entropy of the distribution. So what is the entropy of the distribution? Uh, well, the entropy of the distribution is <laughs> defined to be this formula. So if you have a probability for, to observe uh, a scenario or event, uh, K, and then you basically take log P uh, uh, and then uh, weighted by p, and then summing over all the k's. 
The reason that entropy is associated with this idea is because, uh, for example, if p is very large, close to one, if p is close to one, that means um, that means the system is very deterministic. <laughs> that means you have 100% sure that the system is in certain state. So in that case, the entropy must be very low, and that is indeed the case, because log p, when p is going to, uh, tends to one, it goes to zero, right? So, uh, so the entropy will be zero if your probability is sharply peak at the very sp specific state. But if your probability is uniformly distributed among all possible states, for example, you have all, all the possible states, you have n of them. You have n of all the possible states, and every state uh, appears with one over n probability. Then if you have a one over n here, then this formula basically goes like log of one over n, but there's a minus sign, so that's like log n. And then you are actually summing over all the one over n by n times. So eventually, the entropy in those systems will just be log n if you, go, uh, if you carry out the calculation. So if you are distributing your probability distribution in n possible cases, then the entropy will grow with this n with like a log n. <laughs> so th that's why uh, if, you are, uh, if you are evenly distributing the probability in more and more uh, possibilities, then the entropy will be higher and higher. But it's not linear in the number of uh, scenarios. It's linear in the logarithmic of the number of scenario of the possibilities. Okay, so that's actually uh, uh, that actually matches the definition of entropy. And then uh, entropy is also a, uh, uh, basically a quantity that characterizes negative information. By maximizing the entropy, we are actually minimizing the information, meaning that when we make any assignment to the probability distribution, we don't want to inject additional information that we don't know. So in order to do that, we want to maximize entropy such that we, don't, we, 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 we basically give up our hands and say, I'm most ignorant of the system. Don't ask me any further question that I don't know. So this is the honest <laughs> uh, attitude <laughs> towards uh, assigning probability distributions. And based on that uh, principle, we can actually uh, derive or, and, or actually show that uh, the, the natural probability distribution, the solution is given by, by this one, which is called the Boltzmann distribution. And the derivation is uh, not very difficult. It's uh, just a few lines. Uh, the idea is that uh, we need to uh, study the statistical ensemble where the average energy somehow is known. So although we say, uh, I have minimal number of information, but there's one piece of information that we know. Because energy plays a very special role in physics system. Energy is associated with time translation symmetry. And for many systems that we consider, there is a conservation of energy. But if energy is conserved, then you know that piece of information, right? If you know that the system currently have energy of this amount, then no matter how the system is going to evolve, as long as it preserves time translation symmetry, the amount of energy in the system is not going to change. So you actually know what should be the total energy or what should be the average energy in the system. But the average energy is actually given by this expression, as we said previously. For any physical observable O, if you want to uh, estimate its expectation value, given by the expectation value on every eigenstate weighted by the probability distribution. But, uh, but if you replace the O by this Hamiltonian, it's very special because these eigenstates are the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. So Hamiltonian evaluates on its own eigenstate, just give you the eigenvalue. So it's like an eigenvalue ek weighted by the probability pk and then summing over all the k, that is all the average energy. So we want to keep this average energy at a certain fixed level e, which we know beforehand. And then we want to maximize the entropy of my probability distribution. So the unknown here is p of k. I don't know what, is, what should be the best value of p of k, but I just need to optimize this uh, objective. And then uh, when I do this object optimization, I need to subject to two conditions. The condition number one is that the probability, when you sum over all the scenarios, need to be one, which is the normalization requirement, which is also nat natural. And then uh, the average energy needs to be E. So given these two assumptions, one can show that the optimal, <laughs> the optimal choice of P of K is actually given by this formula, which is 
which is the Boltzmann distribution, which sta says that the P of k will be proportional to e to the minus beta of E k. E k is the energy associated with the k state, and then beta is a prefactor, which is also called uh, inverse temperature. And then this, uh, the, uh, the value of the beta should be determined by, by this equation, actually. So this is just an overall form of the probability distribution. Beta will be determined by this equation, and z, which is the normalization factor, will be determined by the first one. So if you try to, uh, if you try to normalize the distribution, there's a normalization factor. And then if you try to tune beta, then you will change the uh, energy distribution and thereby changing the average value of energy. So in order to match that average value, there is a, there is a temperature that has to be set. And then uh, given that, uh, that leads to uh, the so-called Boltzmann distribution and canonical ensemble of uh, uh, many body systems. Uh, and then uh, this beta is called inverse temperature, Z is normalization factor. And the take home message is that uh, if the system, uh, uh, if, a, if a quantum state has a low energy, if this energy is low, then uh, low means that it's very negative, maybe. If it is negative, then this exponential is very large. So this probability will be very large for <laughs> those uh, energies, uh, low, those level at very low energy. Uh, compared to those level of high energy. So because if you increase the energy on the exponent, you will basically suppress the probability distribution exponentially. So that's the idea. So the, uh, in this distribution, the system always want to be in those states, uh, many body states, that has uh, uh, relatively low energy. And the probability to find the system in higher energy state will be exponentially rare uh, with respect to the uh, energy increase as you go to higher and higher energy. So that is, uh, uh, that is basically Boltzmann distribution and what I want to talk about today. Thank you for your attention.